Yeah, that, that last one, the first thing I can think of is, you know, any of those uh, posts where they have like a bunch of money stacked up on the table or they do the thing where they like run the money across the bar, yeah. <laughs> and then that meme pops up. It's like the, the people with real money aren't doing that. You no, know? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Black Student Success Podcast, where we uh, bring you insight and guidance from successful Black professionals. I'm Selvin, and of course, we uh, appreciate you joining us today. So today, we're going to have Larry Whitley on. He is a, co a corporate uh, attorney who is going to kind of talk about his experience and you know um, things that ha he's run into along his way, as well as just kind of drop some guidance in regards to what he uh, knows about his job. So right, let's welcome. Good. Larry Whitley, how are you doing today? Doing really good, man. I really appreciate you for having me. Um, I kind of wish there was something like this when I was coming up, just because I didn't know how to navigate. Um, and hopefully, if we can get this to the right people, they can figure out how to navigate exactly where they want to go. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, and that's a goal. You know, we're trying to just uh, you know get people to talk about their experiences, so um, you know, so so people can know that it's possible. You're right. So uh, we're gonna start the show how we always do, and and ask you who is Larry Whitley. You know, it's, it's always hard talking about yourself, right? But I think I think I would describe myself as um, a father, a husband, a child of God, a big basketball and boxing fan, um, an attorney. Um, and then finally, I would say um, a proud product of the Milwaukee public school system. Um, and I highlight that because I want kids that look like me to know that no matter where you come from, uh, you can sort of make it out of that situation. Perfect, perfect. Thank you for that. So, you know, with you being a corporate attorney, what really inspired you to take that route when it came to your career? That's a really good question. I would say there are probably three main things. Um, first, coming up, a lot of people told me uh, not to go to law school and that I couldn't be an attorney, and they really discouraged me. Um, and I've always like wanted to do things despite the naysayers, right? And so um, I wanted to prove people wrong. That's one thing. The second thing I would say is coming out of college, I didn't really know what I wanted to do or be. Um, and I knew that having a law degree would sort of be a competitive advantage. And I knew that there were barriers to entry uh, to sort of be an attorney. And I knew that could separate me from everyone else to an extent. Um, and then I guess the third thing would be, um, I've always been intellectually curious. Um, I love learning. Um, and I thought what better way to learn about the law and learn about just how the world works than going to law school. Cool, cool. Yeah, and I'm sure with all of that, even knowing what you've started to do in college, as far as what you studied, I'm sure that all kind of played into those three things that you mentioned. So that that's really cool. So let's actually jump into kind of what that college experience was like for you. So when you got on the campus, uh, you know, we, we both went to Marquette. Uh, what what was that like? And then where did you find the support as you were kind of getting through the, the years? Okay, so I'll separate that into two different buckets, the good and the, the not so good. And yeah. I'm going to be real, I'm going to be real honest here. Um, so the good was, um, you know, I really built lifelong friendships with some of the people that I went through uh, college with, I would say, also being able to be a part of the Marquette men's basketball team as a student manager. That was a really cool experience, uh, just being able to travel with the guys and work with them. Um, guys like Jimmy Butler, Lazar Hayward. Uh, Wes Matthews, Jarrell McNeil. I mean, it was a really cool time to be a part of that sort of team. Um, so that was a unique experience. Um, then obviously just finishing, right? Graduating, you know, I went to college and I finished. Um, so all those things were sort of, when I look back on college and reflect, those are the things that stand out to me as far as what went well. Um, the not so good, you know, culture shock. Um, being a black guy on a predominantly white campus is tough. Um, and I didn't realize at the time, but I feel like I was a shell of myself uh, just because I, I felt like I was being scrutinized at a higher level. Um, being one of four or five black dudes in the entire school of business was tough. Um, if there was a day where I was tired or I wasn't really on my game, people noticed, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was really hard to navigate as a 17, 18 year old. Um, and if it wasn't for programs like the EOP program for first generation uh, college students. Uh, I don't know if I would have made it, to be honest. 
Um, and then just two stories to sort of really, really hone in on the, on the not so good. One is kind of funny. Um, my friends and I, we were uh, just on the Marquette website one day and there was a picture of this black, this black guy that we knew, but he didn't go to Marquette, but he was like the highlight for diversity, right? No. They, they had him on the picture. They took a picture of him on the street um, and he was the front of it. And we're just laughing like, dude, he doesn't even go here. Oh, <laughs> wow. And so, I mean, I think that not to bash Marquette, but that just highlighted that diversity, equity, and inclusion really wasn't a thing. Like they didn't, they weren't looking for us, if that makes sense. Um, and then the second story, really, um, my college roommate, I would say we had an interesting experience. We, you know, we, we became friends over time, but it didn't start that way. I would say um, he really wouldn't talk to me and I couldn't figure out why. Um, and I would say halfway through the semester, he re- like as we started to build a rapport and become friends, he said to me, hey, Larry, I got to tell you something. I said, yeah, so what's up? He said, um, uh, when I found out at the beginning of the year that I'd be rooming with a black guy, I called my mom and cried. And he mm. said, um, I had never, I had never met a black guy before. I, you know, basically all of his sort of ideas and thoughts came from what he had seen on TV. Um, and so just, he didn't know anything about me, but just the fact that I was black, he perceived me as a threat um, and didn't know how to navigate that. And so it kind of reaffirmed what I felt at Marquette that I, I was just want like a, a, a dash of pepper and a sea of salt, you know, like people didn't really uh, understand us. Um, but on the good side, I would say is that because of that, like the black folks that were at Marquette, we, we built a bond and we sort of got through it together. Um, and I, but I do feel like that was the not so good of, of the whole experience at being at a predominantly white institution. And I would yeah. say, I don't have any regrets about the experience, mm-hmm. um, but I do sometimes wonder what life would have been like at a Morehouse or, you know, or a Howard or whatever. Um, so, yeah, yeah. And I, I don't think that's, that's, that's definitely not uncommon, right? Uh, as far as an experience, you know, being at a predominantly white institution, I definitely had some of those same experiences, but at the same time, if there's a great opportunity for, you know, someone who looks like us and it's, you know, in that type of environment, you know, it's good to know how to navigate those types of things, even if it might be a little bit more difficult, you know, at an HBCU or, you know, a place that has a little bit more diversity. It's so good to have those tools knowing, you know, knowing what you're getting into and how to get around that. So it doesn't have an impact on you learning and that main reason why you're at school and um, i'm glad that you were able to find the support you know among other black students and that tends to be a common theme you know once you know that you're the minority and you you know you know catch the black guy across the street you know you meet eyes and then you, you're like okay all right we're, we're good <laughs> you know yep. so um so that's so that's good i'm glad that you were able to, to go into the good and the bad uh, about that now Taking it a step further, let's go into your law school experience. What was that like? I know that you talked to me about some of the experiences that you've had, maybe even comparison to, you know, you know how it was in your undergrad, but what was it like being in law school? I would say law school is a different ball game. You know, college, you still have time to go play basketball for three, four hours and, and go out with your friends. But law school, you're there to become a lawyer. You're there to get a job. You know, some people are there, you know, you're there to fight for justice. Um, and so in order to do that, you have to really know what you're talking about. Um, and so I feel like you have, you have to be extremely disciplined when you're in law school um, because every day is a consistent and daily grind. Um, and it was, it was challenging because you're around people that are high achievers um, who have always been the 3.8, 3.9 kids and we're all in one room and we're graded on a curve. Um, so it was extremely challenging. Um, and again, I felt like I found comfort and the other students that had common interests with me um, that knew how to be personable and, and knew that, yes, take the work serious, but never take yourself too serious. And those were the people that I sort of, you know, uh, would navigate towards or would gravitate towards. So. Cool, cool. And then and then I know that you probably found it a little bit different in terms of the level of competition in law school. Can you talk a little bit to that? Yeah, so like I mentioned, you're with people that are high achievers, um, and every day um, you have a number of different cl- courses that you take, um, and they're different subject matters. So you could be like your first year of law school, you'll take uh, criminal law, you'll take civil procedure, you'll take contracts, you'll take constitutional law, um, and these are all very different subjects. Um, 
And so for one hour, you'll be in criminal law learning about, you know, the criminal justice system. And the next hour, you're learning how to read a contract and things like that. Um, so different skill sets. Um, but, and I would also add that um, I just feel like you have to be very adaptable. That's the word I'm looking for. You have to be mm -hmm. adaptable. You have to adapt quickly. Um, and you have to be on your toes at all times because they use something called the Socratic method, um, which essentially means that the professor can call on whoever they want, whenever they want, tell you to stand up, uh, talk about the case. Um, so you're just always on your A game. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas in college, there were times where you could slack, right? You didn't have to, you didn't, know, you didn't always have to read everything, but in law school, every word matters. Um, every, every paragraph, every page, it all ties into something and you had to be prepared every day. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, um, going from like a, a lecture hall of 300 to probably a class of maybe 20 or less. And then on that level, and you've got the teacher calling you, uh, at any point that, that, that can add the pressure and make sure that you, um, know yourself and that you're, always ready to be called on so um, and 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 not to cut you off and everyone knows like the answer everyone's read the case everyone has their interpretation of what's going on so it's very easy to know like if you know what you're talking about like um if you read the case um if you prepare it, it was very easy there you go cool cool so um so you made it through law school at this point and now you are um you probably even studied about this while you were in law school, but just kind of like the different routes that you can take uh, when it comes to being an attorney, because you're not just an attorney or, you, you know, it's not just in one area or field. So what kind of attorneys are out there? And then what's your specialty? All right. So I'll, I'll tell you a quick step back. So really in law school, um, I would say there's kind of two buckets that you kind of go into. Um, like I said, your first year, um, they kind of tell you what you're going to take. Your second year and third year, you can start sort of tailoring what you want to take towards what you might have a, an interest in in your career. Um, and the two buckets generally are transactional or litigation. Um, so litigation is kind of what most people are familiar with, where you have people um, going to courtrooms or writing briefs and really the, the, you know, the attorneys that you see on TV, I would say. Um, and then transactional um, attorneys. And that's really the route that, that I took. And when, when I sort of think of what a transactional attorney is, is really I'm a business attorney. I'm uh, navigating commercial transactions. I'm advising business clients uh, on sort of business matters, the exchange of money and services, um, assessing risk. Um, these are sort of the things that come in my mind when I think of what a transactional attorney does. Um, and, and I guess the underlying document to transactional law would be the, a contract, you know, it might have a different name, um, whether you're in the entertainment context, the, you know, the, the sports context or whatever. But at the end of the day, uh, the underlying paperwork is something that an attorney typically drafts and reviews and negotiates um, with another counsel. Okay, okay. And then I know that you did, you know, you mentioned that you went to the School of Business in your undergrad, did that help you when it come, came to putting those two pieces together? um you know the the business side and then the law side into what you currently do absolutely and and so i talk to law students quite a bit or even college students and they'll ask me um which way should they go and things of that nature and, and i want to say it really depends on what your interests are i can sort of give you advice on how to become a commercial real estate attorney at a fortune 100 company right i can tailor that advice um, but I can't tell you how to be a patent attorney in DC because it's a very different skill set and, and a very different path. Um, if you want to be a commercial real estate attorney, um, I highly recommend uh, coming out of high school, you go to the best college that you can get into, whatever that means for you. Um, you study real estate, preferably, obviously, if you want to be commercial real estate or get a general business uh, degree, um, maybe even finance, uh, because like I said, these are all corporate transactions, the exchange of money and services. Um, so if you can have that business foundation, I think if you want to be a transactional attorney, you'd be ahead of the game for sure. Um, and then in law school, take those, those sort of classes, just take your, your contract drafting classes, take, you know, those classes that develop those practical skills that you'll need to become a successful commercial real estate or transactional attorney. Um, and I think you, you might've also asked, um, what was the other question in terms of, what other types of transactional attorneys are out there? Um, um, yeah, so I mean, I would say, um, yeah, the different areas that you can work in as a transactional attorney, because you know, you mentioned commercial real estate for you, mm -hmm. um, based on your experience or kind of what you studied or what you know, 
what other areas or industries can a transactional attorney work in? Okay, yeah, so I'll just give a couple examples. One would be, I think I saw that Postmates recently, or sorry, Uber recently acquired Postmates. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a merger and an acquisition. And so there's an attorney out there on both sides that sort of papered that deal. Um, so if you go to law school and you study uh, corporate transactional type courses, um, you could position yourself to be the attorney on that deal. Um, the Milwaukee Bucks, when they built Pfizer Forum, there were attorneys that papered that transaction, um, that negotiated that deal, the, the bonds and, and things of that nature. Um, so really, when you have a, a corporate transactional sort of interest, you want to take those business courses in undergrad, and then in law school, you want to take those practical drafting and, and contract review type courses to prepare you for the world of business, essentially. Mm, okay. Okay. So yeah. So a lot of business related stuff. It sounds like. Mm -hmm. right. And if you don't, and if you don't know, um, sort of what area you are interested in, um, that's fine. Uh, I have a lot of friends that in college they took. Um, honestly, they took courses that they knew they can get the highest grades in because they wanted to go to the best law school that they can go that they could get into. Um, so maybe they majored in English or something, not saying that's an easy degree, but maybe for them, it was a way for them to get all A's. So they graduated undergrad with the 4.0, which was very attractive to some of the top law schools in the country. Um, just having that because you're going to as an attorney, you're going to write, right? You're going to have to know how to write. And so and so having that foundation uh, may, maybe they strategically decided that was the best play for them. But again, um, you know, I don't like giving blanket advice. It really depends on your situation and what you're trying to do. Um, but I would, I would say, don't take advice from people uh, or be cautious of advice from people that have never been where you want to go. You mm -hmm. want to talk to, if you want to be a trademark attorney, you need to go find somebody uh, that's a trademark attorney and figure out how to get there. Um, and now with social media, everything is so accessible. Um, you know, LinkedIn is, is a great way to find people. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me. Um, and if I don't know the answer, I'll find somebody in that lane. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you for that. And, and being able to provide the uh, the differences between all of that uh, because and especially the the advice of taking advice from somebody who's kind of gone down that road so mm -hmm. um yeah i'm sure that's where you can get the most value out of that um and it's also good to know that you know you don't have to be a business major to actually be successful mm -hmm. you know within that um but even to kind of touch on you know the work that you do and even probably even the colleagues that you've interacted with what skills do you find are best in someone in your position, whether they are, um, you know, specifically a transactional attorney or just even being attorney. What skills do you um, do you find are really valuable that even you know someone in high school can even start working on now? Okay, so if I'm talking to a high school student, I would say um, attention to detail is something that is probably number one uh, for being an attorney. Because, like I said. A transactional attorney is really papering deals all the time. You're reading contracts, you're negotiating contracts, um, and every word matters. Um, and it's very easy to gloss over words or skim over words and contracts um, if you haven't built up the stamina to read 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 page uh, documents. And yeah. so attention to detail is, is number one for sure, um, because when a word changes or if a word is missing, it could change the entire context or the outcome of a, of a, of a document, really. Um, so attention to detail is one. Um, critical thinking, the ability to sort of analyze situations and think critically about them um, and, then have, and then have an opinion about it and, and be able to sort of express that opinion in a clear and concise way is also something that I think is very important. Um, I feel like, so my uncle, taught me how to play chess when I was little. Uh, and I felt like I developed that, that critical thinking piece from playing chess with him because in chess, every move matters. Yeah. Um, just like uh, in the law, every, every word matters. Um, so uh, critical thinking, uh, I forgot the first one already. I think it was attention to detail. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Uh, th those are the two that really stick out to me. Um, then just having good judgment. I'm not sure how you develop that. Uh, just li li life experience. Experience, and, yeah. Life will uh, teach you that. <laughs> then uh, if we're getting really specific, uh, like I mentioned earlier, business acumen is something that you need um, to be a, a tr you know transactional attorney. Um, and then just assessing risk, uh, figuring out how to assess risk. 
Um, risk doesn't mean a bad thing. It just means that there's something that's uncertain uh, that's happening and, and being able to understand that risk and accurately um, weigh the risk is something that's also important. Nice, nice. Thank you for that. Now, um, now if we take all, all of these, you know, pieces of your identity, right? You know, you got first generation, um, you know, black students, attorney, if we, you know, put all these things together and, you know, maybe a piece of that can attach to some of our listeners today, what advice would you give to them if they're looking to pursue, pursue a degree in, in law? I think, like I mentioned earlier, one of them, one of my motivations was just um, the naysayers, people that thought I couldn't do it. Uh, maybe I don't fit what the typical image of an attorney is. Um, I've had encounters where people uh, thought I was a paralegal or administrative assistant when I said I worked in the law department. Um, and so I would say, despite the naysayers, if this is something that's really in, in your heart and in, in, your, in your gut, just pursue it, just do it. Don't listen to people that haven't done it. Um, you know, don't get me wrong, like they might say it's expensive. It is expensive. But um, if you put your mind to it and, and put the work in, you'll land a job that you'll be able to pay down that debt. Or, or um, if you're doing well enough, you know, from high school, college and, and beyond, maybe you might earn some some merit scholarships or whatever. So just uh, if it's something you really want to do, put your mind to it. Um, and then also there is no right path. I used to think there was only one path. Uh, because the law profession focuses so much on pedigree, right? So if I said, yeah, I went to Harvard, you start gathering certain uh, thoughts about me and you automatically assume that I'm just this, this genius, right? And, and maybe you don't sort of assign those same uh, sort of things if I say I go to, to a different school, right? And so I would say, forget all that. Um, focus on your path. Get into the best school that you can get into. Um, it is your life. It, and, and really, block out everyone else um, and really focus on what you want to do with your life. Perfect. No, I think that's very, very good advice. The whole running your own race type of thing, because you can get caught up in, oh, uh, well, you know, they got into Harvard or they got into Yale and, you know, they're this much better than me or whatever the case is. If you just kind of focus on you, you know, you have that own definition of success and then you can just kind of follow that compass, if you will. Exactly. I always say comparison is the thief of joy. Mm. Comparison is the thief of joy. Really run your own race. Love your life. Love what you've got going. Put in the work, you know, strive for the best. But if it's not Harvard, that doesn't mean you can't be an attorney. I've never started a negotiation call and said, hey, my name is Larry and I went to Marquette Law. That, it, mm. doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Uh, when you're on a negotiation call, you're talking about protecting your clients. You're talking about whatever the issues are. You're not, nobody's asking what school you went to. Um, so that's just, that's just my perspective. People might disagree, but you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, Hey, it's, it's, it's a good perspective to have, you know, it does take the pressure off of, you know, any outside surroundings, especially if you can kind of control what you do and how successful you are. You're not letting those things on the outside interfere with that. So, mm -hmm. um, so I appreciate that. Um, now, before we do get out of here, uh, I do want to kind of go through some fun questions, you know, just to kind of get your opinion on some things. So um, first thing is uh, name one underrated show and then name one overrated show. Underrated, I would say Westworld on HBO is pretty underrated to me. I don't hear many people talking about it, but, you know, I'm, I'm really into like the sci-fi stuff mm -hmm. and, and, and the futuristic wave and that show um, is one that sticks out to me as underrated. Uh, definitely check it out. Um, overrated would be The Walking Dead. That's mm. a show that I stopped watching. Um, I don't know, after season three or something like that, just because I felt like um, it was the same thing over and over again. It was like, uh, hey, there's some zombies. Oh, we killed the zombies. Um, <laughs> oh, there's some more zombies. You know, like, so um, I, I got sick of it. Uh, but I know a lot of people, like, really love that show. They created, you know, podcasts about it and spinoffs and et cetera. But I just couldn't get into it past a few seasons. Yeah, yeah. That went, how many seasons? Like, eight, nine, ten or something like that? Like I said, I stopped at the three, so I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. All right, so. Now we, uh, we, you know, all joke about the, you know, the black card, this imaginary card that we all have that, you know, <laughs> determines our blackness or whatever you will. So if this is like a real thing, you know, what, what uh, experience would you kind of put into that, that, you know, all, all black folks need to experience to have this card? 
I would say if I'm understanding the question correctly, I would just say it, it's the head nod for me, yeah. right? Like when I'm when I'm walking through a mall or a store and I see another brother, I give him a head nod, right? And yeah. if they don't return it, I you know I start getting real questionable yeah. about it. You know? <laughs> and that's so universal, right? You know, yeah. I, you don't even you don't even have to be taught that. That just thing something that you pick up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely, definitely you, the head nod for sure. There you go. There you go. All right, so now. <laughs> um top three memes of all time what would you say those are for you top three memes of all time um the one with the guy on the phone he's got like the blue shirt on he's on the phone if you're familiar with that one that yeah, one's yeah. always funny like they always put really funny captions next to that one mm-hmm. um another one would be there is this little girl she's standing uh she's looking back and there's a house on fire behind her <laughs> I like that one because, um, you know, as I said, I'm a commercial real estate attorney. I advise my clients on real estate investments across the country. Um, and sometimes I feel like some of the advice that I give, like, so as an attorney, you basically are giving advice. You're a sounding board. You're, you're, you're telling uh, your opinion on what could happen or the risk. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes clients just is in one ear and out the other. Um, mm-hmm. And so that meme sticks out to me because, um, sometimes I feel like some of the advice that they ignore could result literally in a commercial building, oh, you know, no. fire you know, um, so, um, that meme sticks out to me as, as number two. And then uh-huh. number three would be, um, the guy in the blue shirt, um, the, why you always lying me that uh-huh. one, I've seen that one. Like, like, uh, I like that one so much just because I think social media, uh, this is just my opinion. Again, people are so self-absorbed, um, and people are so like, uh, thirsty to hold themselves out as, as experts in certain lanes mm-hmm. um, and to, to, uh, to an extent, falsify credentials. And, and you just see so many things on, on the internet that just simply aren't true. Um, and I think it's a product of social media and, and things of that nature. So that those are the three memes that really stick out to me. Yeah, um, that, that last one, the first thing I can think of is, you know, any of those uh, posts where they have like a bunch of money stacked up on the table or they do the thing where they like run the money across the car yeah. <laughs> and then that meme pops up. It's like the, the people with real money aren't doing that. You no, know, like, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Loudest, loudest voice in the room is normally yeah. the brokest, right? So, Absolutely. <laughs> um, name one thing on your bucket list. I know, um, you know, this COVID thing is kind of stopping us from doing a lot of things that we want to get into. But, you know, if there was something, you know, that's, you know, that wasn't, preventing you from getting out to go do that thing you know what, what's one thing on your bucket list uh so i want to say two things one would be tra- uh, travel to africa um so me and my wife we like traveling we've been to greece italy and a few other places um but africa is somewhere that i definitely want to go specifically um my stepdad is from cameroon uh, in mm. west africa so i definitely want to get to cameroon um and i also want to get to kenya and, and seychelles so so those would be some of the things on my travel bucket list. And then my personal bucket list would be um, really one day I want to be in a position to buy my mom a house. Um, I just feel like my mom poured so much, you know, poured so much into me and really sacrificed so much for me to get to where I am today um, that I, I feel like it's my duty to, you know, like how like uh, pro athletes show up with the, with the keys to the house. I want to, I want to do that. Uh, I want to do that one day. That's what's and, up it'll be powerful to do that as an attorney because I also want to show kids that there's more, there's more than one way to get to um, the money. As you say. Yeah, <laughs> you <know? laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's yeah, what's up, know. man. I, I like that. I like that. Now, last question. Um, if there was, um, you know, any, any thing of all the, the soul food options that are out there, if there was one that you just want to just wipe off the face of the earth, which one would that be? So, you know, I love like greens and cornbread. Like that's my, that's my go-to, but my family also sometimes makes chitlins. Uh, um, and, and that's the one, that's the one that's got to go. That's gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> See, I've never had them, but yeah. the way that people describe and like, you know what it is, you know, it's pig intestines yeah. and whatever yeah. the case is. Um, 
they never make it sound good. Like even, even if you didn't know what it was, um, there's just all, all the things like the way it looks, the way it smells and, and all that. It's uh, not, not appealing, but that was, that was the one that I was thinking of. <laughs> oh, that's exactly it. The way it looks, the way it smells. I mean, it's just not appealing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, Larry, I, I appreciate your time. Um, before we do wrap things up, if you want to let people know where they can reach you in case they had questions about being attorney, um, about, you know, your line of work, I'm going uh, to give you the floor for that. Yeah. So you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Larry Whitley, or you can also find me on most uh, social media platforms. Uh, LA underscore GQ is the name. <laughs> there you go. So uh, yeah, reach out. Um, I'm very accessible. Um, and if I don't know the answer, I'll find somebody that really can uh, help you navigate whatever you're trying to do. So, perfect. Perfect. Thank you. We'll put that again. I just, I just want to, I just want to thank you uh, for this opportunity. I really think um, that if we can touch one or two high school or, or college kids and, and help them figure out um, where they want to go or, or just give them somebody, an example of somebody that looks like them that's doing it. Um, I think we, then we've done our job. Yeah, absolutely. No. And I thank you for just even, you know, uh, giving your time and, and, and your knowledge. And, and yeah, if we get to one person, that's, that's really, that's really all that matters. But you know, hopefully we'll get to more. Mm -hmm. um, so again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your knowledge. Um, thank you, everybody for listening. Um, if you want, uh, feel free to, to subscribe to our podcast. Uh, we're on all major streaming services, YouTube and all that. Um, and check out our website, inquirehire.com. We've got a lot of great information there. So until then, peace to you. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right, man. God bless.